Hello and welcome back to the SBK channel for the second episode of the Aintree mini podcast series. My name is Tom Collins and as ever I'm joined by Ross Miller. Another 15 minute episode incoming for you today where we'll go through the majority of races on Friday's card at Aintree. We'll kick off the action with the grade one mild main novices chase which will be run over three mile one furlongs. Now some good horses have won this race. Last year Jerry Colomb won it before finishing second in the Gold Cup this year. Mike Bite won it in 2017, Native River in 2016. And if you go all the way back to 2008, you'll see Big Bucks on the Roll of Honor. I'm sure everyone will remember him. This year's field, however, isn't overly strong. Kim Muir winner, I Know The Way You're Thinking, is the current favourite. Ultima winner, Chianti Clasco, is second favourite. Turner's fifth, Oroco, is also in the field. So you're looking at lots of different races from Cheltenham, all coming together, but it's not the best of grade ones. What do you like, Ross, in this opener? Well, it probably comes as no surprise to anyone that's listened to these podcasts or any length of time, TC. I'm going to stick with Chianti Classico. I am concerned about whether he can hold his form from a really big run uh, in the Ultima into Aintree. But th- the same is through with, with I Know The Way You're Thinking, Anna Rocco. Uh, Broadway Boy is interesting, isn't he? Sort of coming here, having missed Cheltenham. But the cheap pieces are a strange move because they told us that the reason he ran poorly at Warwick was because he scoped badly afterwards. It makes me wonder whether he's perhaps not showing as much at home as he was in the early part of the year. That put me off him. Giovinco, I think, is a really smart horse. I'm just not sure he'll stay this trip on this ground. I think on a better ground, he perhaps might. I'm really interested to see this horse back in intermediate trips next year. So it's Chianti Classico for me. He's going to love the ground. He definitely stays. He's a really good jumper. Might get a few of them at it with his jumping. So uh, Chianti Classico and Kim Bailey for me. Yeah, I don't hate that viewpoint by any means. And actually, you could probably just give a chance to all six of these runners. Not much separates them on the weights, um, on handicap figures. And, you know, there's not much separating them in the market either. 11 to 4 favourite is, I know the way you're thinking. 10 to 1, the outsider being Giovinco. I'm going to be with the jolly in here. In my opinion, he was the most impressive winner at the Cheltenham Festival. Now, he didn't beat much in the Kim Year, but the way he did it was so visually impressive. And I've just got to be with him. He's open to loads more improvement especially given his connections, yet he's already the highest rated horse in this race. So I know the way you're thinking for me. On to the two mile, four furlong handicap hurdle now, which we run at 2.20 p.m. A wide open market here with a maximum field of the 22 runners. What's your viewpoint? Uh, it, it's tricky, TC. I, I, I'm just liking that a Castle de Mox comes back here, having run at Cheltenham. I think they're figuring him out on the go. He was... Probably beaten by the trip in the Betfair hurdle, but also he got a little bit wound up before he lost his shoe. And having stood really patiently for much of the, the reshoeing, he then got a bit agitated and that perhaps didn't help him. I think the trip wasn't to his liking. He was then too keen in the uh, Martin Pipe at the Cheltenham Festival uh, where that trip looked more suitable. And given how keen he was, I thought it was a pretty big run. The hood goes on now. If he settles a bit, that might be the key. He's going to cope with his slower ground. Um yeah, I just, I just, the more I looked at it, the more I gravitated towards him in an open field. Katira is a mare I really liked last year, been a bit disappointing this year, and perhaps just a bit high in the weights for a, a race of this nature. So a Castle de Mots and Willie Mullins Paul Towner for me. Question for you quickly about the hood. You've rightly mentioned that the first time hood in Ireland or the UK goes on a Castle de Mots, but this horse wore a hood in France on a couple of outings. I know that there's a lot of talk sometimes around uh, the refitting of headgear, whether it be blinkers, hood, cheek pieces, and whether it would have the same effect as when you put it on for the first time. Now, he hasn't worn a hood the last couple of starts. Do you reckon for the horse's mindset, it will be like having the headgear on for the first time? Or will he remember that he's had the hood on before? I, I think there's two different aspects to that, TC. Blinkers designed to sharpen a horse up being headgear and a hood designed to settle a horse down. If the hood is going to work, it should just carry on working. And I know, particularly talking to Tom Lacey, if he puts a hood on, he is very, very reluctant to take it off, even if he feels the horse is getting more relaxed at home. He's just had a bad sort of history of removing headgear and it it not going so well. So I think with blinkers, the tendency is if they wear them all the time, they become a bit numb to them and you want them to sort of come on and spark them to life. With the hood, it's more more of a soothing thing, like your kid having their sort of comfy blanket, really. And hopefully... He'll remember his comfy blanket and uh, settle down nicely for a nice lullaby round entry. Yeah, very interesting indeed. I like the fitting of the headgear for a Castle de Mots and I'm definitely not uh, against him. I'm going to be with making headway though. He just interests me a, a little bit more than uh, the Irish runners in here. He finished behind a couple of these in the novice division earlier this season, but I like that they've kept him fresh for entry and I love that they're stepping him up in trip. 
that will definitely suit. On to the Grade 1 Top Novices Hurdle now at 2.55pm. Cracking little race this, Mystical Power and Firefox, the second and the third from the Supreme at Cheltenham, reopposed. And Top Mares, Dysar Enos and Cheltenham winner, Golden Ace, are in the lineup too. Who do you like? I think this is probably going to be the most competitive race of the day, TC. Mystical Power, I think, was just simply outstayed on on the ground by Slade Steel at uh, Cheltenham in the Supreme. He looks a quicker horse, so maybe a flat track will suit him. But I still have concerns over his jumping. He did jump well enough at Cheltenham, but it's no given that he's going to jump as well here. Firefox is probably the unlucky one in the Supreme, wasn't he? Because I got hampered, short of a bit of room, looked like he stayed on quite nicely. If he gets a trouble-free passage, he's interesting. As is Mr. Giff. That was just his second start in the Supreme when finishing fifth. So he's got huge potential to improve. He'll like the ground. The two mares, I think, are really smart, but I think both of them would prefer a better surface. They look to me to be speedy uh, types and the slower ground might blunt that speed for them. Um, I'm going to go with a fresh angle and go with lump sum. He missed Cheltenham. I thought by design, but I actually read today that he had a little bit of a bug. Uh, before Cheltenham, so they, they bypassed that. He was really impressive when winning the Dovecot. The ground would be no issue at all. Arrives here fresh. I think I'll get a run for my money. I'd much rather side with a fresh horse coming in than go with a, a Cheltenham horse and it run below par. Um, so uh, Sam Thomas, uh, Sam Tristan Davis and Lump Sum for me. 14 to 1 Lump Sum. Pretty good price as well, considering there are maybe question marks about all the other horses at the top of the market. It's just not a betting race for me. Uh, I find it super difficult to compare the Supreme with the Mayor's division and then wondering which horses are going to come out of Cheltenham the best. Dysot Enos is a little bit too short for my liking, especially with the uh, collateral form between her and Golden Ace. I don't think there should be seven points between them in the market anyway. So I can't have Dysot Enos. Just a watching race, but a cracking race at that. Next up is the grade one Melling Chase at 3.30pm. Last year's winner, Pick Dorhey, is back to try and retain his crown, though the ground may have gone against him. Ryanair Victor and the runner-up, Protectorat and Umboy Allen, both in the field, as is the brilliant John Bond. Will Nicky Henderson have a fantastic entry this time around? Is this John Bond's chance to shine? Yeah, I think it probably is, TC. I mean, you're going to have a watching race, uh, the race before. I'm going to have a watching race here, Reid. I find it very difficult just to... I like to try and figure out how I think the race might be run. And if I can't, it tends to make me a bit jittery about having a particularly firm opinion. And I'm just not sure... Who's going to be well suited by this? John Bond has looked for all of his life like a slower ground and a, and a longer trip is going to really suit him. But he's coming here quite fresh off the back of that run at Cheltenham where, where he, he jumped poorly. Nick de Boinville, I think, is a big plus. He could just take his four to another level. And if he does, he's going to win this and win it in some style. Protectorat, as we know, is a horse I just struggle to gra- get a grasp with. I, I struggle to, to be with him. But... It's got the best form in, or the best recent form in this race, winning uh, the Ryanair. The ground is going to suit him. I think the track suits him pretty well. Like you say, Pick Dory won it last year. Ground's not going to suit him. Conflated was third in the Ryanair. I struggle to see any way he reverses the form in Protect Rat if they both turn up. The one that is interesting is Easy Game. Willie Mullins said when he won at Garron last time, he said to the stewards that the small field had elicited a big improvement in uh, the horse's performance. He loves the ground. All of his best form is on, on heavy ground. There were six runners at Gowron. There's only seven here. Uh, he's a decent enough price. So I'll sit on my hands and not have a bet. But if I were to have one, it probably would be him at a speculative price. But I think it's a really interesting race. Yeah, Easy Game's currently 16 to 1. He looks like the pace angle in the race anyway, providing Protector Act doesn't really go forward with it. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Basically, it's an interesting race. I hope as a neutral that John Bond wins. Again, it feels weird saying this about all the grade ones, but... I won't be having a bet in here. I'll just be rooting for John Bon and hope that he can really shine back at Aintree after a break. The Topham is up next, back over the national fences. And I really like Bill Baxter in this race. It's not something you generally say in the Topham that you really like a horse, but I just think he's been laid out for it after winning this last year in facile fashion. He's able to compete off just one pound higher this time around. Jumps very well, gets first time cheap pieces. Are you with me? Yeah, I can see the angle TC. I mean, that's a, a good bit of training, isn't it? Well, I mean, if a different trainer was doing it, we might be saying different. But, you know, to, to, to lose £7 of the £8 rise he got last year in a season is is good going. Um, I can definitely see the angle. The ground suits, like you say, he's a good jumper. He's just short enough for me, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if he were to win it. I thought your darling was, was an interesting horse. He's best when fresh. 
did win a bumper on, on heavy ground. I would think Ben Pauling had his eye on this since winning uh, back in November. Exceptional jumper of offence, but he's on a £9 higher mark now for, for winning last time. That's going to demand a bit more. Just slightly put me off. So I'm actually going to go with two Henry de Bromhead horses. Life in the Park was one of my eye catches from the Champion Festival in the plate. He was hampered coming down the hill and then got outpaced because as he got hampered, they quickened. So it sort of was a, a double whammy, if you like. And then he flew home. The soft, heavy ground. Well, soft ground is OK. Heavy is a question mark. But, you know, we might be drying out a little bit by Friday. Maybe. <laughs> I'm not so sure. Uh, he looks well handicapped. Henry de Bromhead's horses always jump very well. I thought he was really interesting. And then his other horse, Chantreuse, stays really well, definitely handles heavy ground. Like I said, the yard's in good form. Got a lovely light weight, just 10 stone 9, which might prove to be really useful in these sort of stamina sapping contests. Um, I just like the look of him under Daroki. Yeah, Life in the Park 12 to 1 and Chantreuse 20 to 1, both for Ross and Bill Baxter 5 to 1. Favourite for me. In that race. Now, the final event that we're going to cover on this podcast is the Grade One Sefton. This hasn't been a great hunting ground uh, for favourite backers with just three winners in the last ten years. Lucinda Russell's won two of the last three renewals. I'm going to have a few quid on Croke Park at a price here. He'll love the extra distance and the ground, though he does have to prove his quality. Who do you like, Ross? Well, I'm going to split my stake. TC, the jukebox man, and I'm still struggling to get over the pain having tipped him at. 33 to 1 for the Albert Bart, and he, he looked the winner every yard of the race bar the, the finishing line. Um, like I said, I repeat myself, but if he's recovered from that Cheltenham exertion, and that's no sure thing, I think perhaps with the novices, you might see them struggle to hold their form because they're younger, less mature horses. But if he has recovered, he's got ideal conditions again here. Ben uh, Keelan Woods was on one of the Tuesday podcasts before Champ said this horse can't have the ground soft enough. He's a really good jumper, which he showed at Cheltenham bar the final hurdle. Um, he's got his conditions again. I think he is right to be close to the head of the market. But I also want to side with a sort of slightly unexposed one that's coming here for a Shanna Bob for Nicky Henson's yard. Missed the festival because of the concerns over the yard form. And, and uh, the Donnellys as owners were, were the first to sort of pull all of their horse, if you like. You know, they came out in dribs and drabs, but theirs were the first to come out. Um, he's proven himself to be a dower stayer and he's just looked like he's a horse the better the race and the more he gets dragged through a race the better effect he's going to be seen to he's going to love this ground so shannon bob and jukebox man at split stakes and that is the last race we're covering i just wanted to give a nod to one in the last the 515 it's a bit of a speculative one but pika for dan skelton this horse had some really good novice form um, without winning he's been off for a year he's down to a mark of 127 he's had a wind up it's by gentle wave, so the ground won't be an issue at all. On jockey bookings, he's not the yard's first choice. But if he's ready to go, and the scouts can definitely get one ready first time out, I think he's very well handicapped. And if he's not, and you'll know by the market in the morning, I think, but if not, do stick him in your tracker, because I think this is a horse that's very well handicapped off 127. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you put up P car back in, I think it was 2022, around Christmas time when he ran at Newbury. He was a relatively short pass favourite that day. Well, he wasn't when you tipped him, but he was well backed, as many of Dan Skelton's horses are. And I like that you're keeping faith with him. Yeah, no, I think he's he's definitely got a pot in him, but it's, with the Skelton guy, it's just finding the right pot, isn't it? And noticing it when they notice it. Yeah, exactly that. It still looks well handicapped, though, for mark of one, two, seven. Excellent stuff. We've covered all the races there. I have no strong fancy in the last, so I'm not going to chime in. Um, but we've now got the nap and next best for Friday. Ross, you can go first. Nap, the more I look, the more confident I got is a Castle de Mott in the 220. And the next best is Chianti Classico, hoping he's going to hold his form in the 145. A Castle de Mott is 12 to 1. Chianti Classico is currently 7 to 2. My nap is going to be Bill Baxter in the Topham at 405. And my next best is going to be I Know the Way You're Thinking in the Mild Mate at 145. They're 5 to 1 and 9 to 4 or 11 to 4, actually, respectively, right now. Okay, one off for you to know about before we sign off on this mini pod. All new SVK users will get £30 in free bets when you bet £10 for the first time. Head over to SBK for that offer and many more offers and promotions throughout this week and in the future. Please join us again tomorrow night on SBK's channel on YouTube and Spotify as we look towards Saturday's Grand National Card. Now, we won't be covering that race in great detail. That podcast is already up on YouTube. Go check it out now if you haven't already. We run through every single runner and all give uh, myself, Ross and Jess Stafford give our one, two, three, and four for the big race. 
but we will be covering the undercard in that podcast that's coming tomorrow night. So please tune in. Also subscribe and like below if you enjoyed this podcast. We'll see you next time.